platform, although we do make live streams on YouTube as well. And we can't wait for BitChute to include live streaming and playlists and other features on its platform. But in any case, there is exclusive content there, such as our video about hydroxychloroquine, which we released on uh, March 19th of 2020, if you're wondering. And uh, yeah, so thanks to our subscribers over there on BitChute. Again, check out the exclusive content if you haven't. Some of it's redundant content that you can also find at youtube.com slash smashamash. Again, twitch.tv slash smashamash is a fantastic live streaming platform. If you haven't pressed like and subscribe on YouTube, please do so if you're new here. And don't forget to tell your friends and foes about the channel. Nobody else is doing it. And it's... We've barely even just begun to create content. Content such as our cosmology segments. So today's cosmology segment is so jam-packed full of stuff that we're going to have to blast through. Starting out with the astronomy photo of the day. And this one is of SpaceX. And the plume created by the spacecraft as four astronauts were delivered to the International Space Station. I played it a second time, so you can all freak out about how it's geoengineering. Next, looking at the speed of stellar rotations. Were you aware that there is a relationship between the way the fields behave on stars and their rotational speed? Well, it's a known thing. We've covered it before in the cosmology segments. If you haven't checked out our other cosmology segments, check out youtube.com slash smashamash slash playlists. As we've talked about this, as stars have two sets of fields. So you've got the poloidal fields, which are where the north and south poles of the stars are located. And then you've got the toroidal field, which is a donut-shaped field that goes around their equator in most cases. That field is the extent to which the poloidal fields overlap each other. We call it the sun's B field. And these fields are directly related to the rotational speed of the star. So without getting super in-depth into this, this is a paper about weakened magnetic braking supported by astro-seismic rotation rates of Kepler dwarfs. Uh, but the point is, folks, that all stars are variable stars. And we know very little about stellar life cycles. Astroseismology is one of the emerging frontiers. And uh, rotation rates are related to magnetic fields. So if you see the sun's rotation rate changing, that's pretty important. We'll be on top of it. Here's another story. By the way, that one was from phys.org in the astronomy and space section. Here's another one about a tidal event. So this, a tidal event, folks, is what happens when a star and its orbit and rotation and so on affect another star and its orbit and rotation. Sometimes this happens around a supermassive radio source located at a place like perhaps a galactic core or even a less massive, massive radio source like what, what you would refer to as uh, a medium mass black hole. We'll, we'll just refer to it as a medium mass massive radio source. But it looks like we may be seeing the silhouette of a spaghettified star. So, of course, if a thing like a star gets too close to a much more massive object, you could have it start to break into a thread, a filament, etc. A quote. The researchers know the black hole is facing them from its pole because they detect its x-rays. The accretion disk is only part of a black hole system that emits this type of radiation. If they were looking edge on, they wouldn't see the accretion disk's x-rays. Moreover, the absorption lines are narrow, says lead author Giacomo Canizzaro. They're not broadened by the Doppler effect like you'd expect when you'd be looking at a rotating disk. So that's another phys.org article. Here's another one about the sun's effects on the Earth's magnetosphere. We talk about this all the time on the channel in the form of direct data. I don't think we really have to spend a whole lot of time on this one, but it's yet another phys.org article. The effects of solar flares on Earth's magnetosphere. So we see induced magnetism as a result of this. 
and all kinds of other things as solar protons rain down on the magnetosphere. While past studies have gathered substantial evidence of the effects that solar wind can have on Earth's magnetosphere, the impact of solar flares is poorly understood. Solar flares are highly explosive events that can last from a few minutes to hours and be detected using x-rays for optical devices. So they're, t they're only talking about the radiation here, folks. And of course, we do see things like changes in the deabsorption region of the ionosphere as a result of incoming x-rays. Here's a quote. We demonstrated that solar flare effects extend throughout the geospace via electrodynamic coupling and are not limited to, as previously believed, to the atmospheric region where radiation energy is absorbed. Due to similar solar magnetosphere ionosphere coupling process in other Earth-like planets, our study also provides new clues for exploring and understanding the effects of solar flares on other planets. In my future research, I plan to study the effects of flares on planets with the same magnetosphere, such as Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn. So perhaps have a read on that again in the phys.org's phys astronomy and space section, the solar flares effects on magnetospheres. Today's random number is 108. We're picking one between 1 and 1,031 to coincide with an object at the Neil Gorel Swift Bat X-ray Observatory. 108 coincides with Quasar B0317 plus 183, a BL Lasserte object, a type of galaxy with an active galactic nucleus where one of the fields is pointed directly at you. So if you've got a spiral galaxy, folks, here's your spiral galaxy. And if you're looking perfectly perpendicular to that disk, you're probably looking down the poloidal field. And if you're looking down the poloidal field, viewing the galaxy from the side, it might look like this, just a cigar shape. But you would have these field jets coming out in this direction. And if you're located inside of this field jet, it may be a, a quasar or a blazar and so on. This one, a BL Lasserte object, is an X-ray emission source. There you can see the historic X-ray data from that. Let's check it out on Sinbad. And it's looking pretty dim. It's probably a distant quasar, folks. You can see how dim it appears. Let's check it out on the Chandra. How about the multi-mirror project? Not showing up there either. How about on the two mass? Does it show up in infrared? And indeed it does. And there's your quote random and quote object of the day, Quasar B0317 plus 18. And let's close things out with two more stories. Here's some current cosmic ray data as here at the Smash News Network, we prefer for you to have objective data, not a bunch of nonsensical BS about things like cosmic rays. So here is the Apatite and Barentsburg neutron monitor data. So at Apatite, we see an uptick here over the past 30 days. And at Barentsburg, we see a slight downtick over the past 30 days, but mostly flat, a slight downtick. Next, we'll go farther south to Athens, Greece. Here's the Athens neutron monitor. Small downtick in the past 30 days at Athens. How about Mexico City even farther south? Pretty flat on the past 30 days at Mexico City. And we'll also check Olu, Finland, and then go as far south as we can get to two Antarctican monitors. So there's Olu, Finland. Small uptrend over the past 30 days at Olu. DOMC Antarctica pretty flat over the past 30 days, and DOMB Antarctica, similarly flat, almost the same graph there at a slightly different amplitude at DOMB and DOMC. Last but not least, how about AG Carinae, an ultra-hot star with a stellar wind probably somewhere, somewhere in the realm of 10 times the solar wind speed and density. A.G. Carinae recently featured here in some NOAA photography, so some fantastic imagery there of this star. And this, uh, this halo around this star is like nearly five light years in diameter. You'll find this all over the science wire today as well. The hot giant star. One of the brightest in the Milky Way galaxy. 
A.G. Carinae. I'll let the article scroll and then I'll play SciTech Daily's animation. It's pretty well conceived. And this type of luminous blue variable is believed to be uh, near the, quote, end of its life cycle, end quote. Do we truly understand stellar life cycles, though, folks? That's the question that I have for you. Do we truly understand stellar life cycles? Have we ever seen a star born or die? Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. So here's A.G. Carinae, and I'll just play a little clip of this to encourage you to check out the SciTech Daily article. Fantastic view of this. And you're looking at multiple wavelengths there. Yowzers. Stunning imagery. And here's a bit of a close-up of the halo. Look at the box-like shape. Look at the box-like shape. You can see these like 90-degree angle looking areas also. Very interesting. And the likelihood of a jet directed away from you is also visible there. So some absolutely incredible imagery. It does look like there is a jet back in the... Uh, 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 hey, stop that. All right, I apologize. Anyway, check out the article. It's on SciTechDaily.com, and that's today's Cosmology segment. We'll have to say goodbye to Twitch, and we'll return for the Meteorology segment. <laughs>